I'm Martha Gillette, and this is Annika Jane. And Annika and I come from the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology, but, but deep down, we're neuroscientists. And I'm going to be telling you a little bit about neuroscience today. But first of all, I'd like to say that it's interesting in the context of cross-disciplinary research, Annika came from a biotechnology undergraduate program in India. And then she came into the molecular and cellular biology graduate program and looked around at various programs there. And then when she came to my lab, Larry had just left and gone to Rashid's lab. And Annika stepped in and assumed more of an interface with engineering. And she's going to be telling you a little bit about that today. Shortly after her talk, she's going to be leaving us because she's heading for Singapore very shortly. And she's heading for, I think, O'Hare tonight. So this is the last talk we'll hear from her for a little while. now. I interpreted the instructions a little differently than Rashid did, so I actually have a couple of context slides um, just to let you know where we are. We're going to be a big, taking a big shift from um, cells and cell culture to looking at neurons. Now, let me show me how to. Okay, so what I like to tell people when we're moving to from any old cell to neurons is that neur neurons are unique. The cells that make up the brain are very unusual. They start life as neuroblasts, round cells, floating in a culture dish, like many other cells do. But And each one of those neuroblasts makes two kinds of cells. But the kinds of cells they make are very unusual. The cell body here is that big, bright green thing on the lower left. And that cell then has these extensions, which become very long, very polarized, very highly branched. And on the branches, you have specializations that let you walk, let you talk, let you learn things, and let you remember. And so part of neuroscience is understanding these complexities. I guess I said all that. Specialized for communication and change. So those are two kinds of cells. Now, these, of course, are in a culture dish. That's the way many people still look at the properties of single cells. But this is what they look like in the brain. And this is cells from a brain bow mouse where different types of cells have a different intrinsic coloration. And what you can see here in blue, the big blue circles are the Purkinje cells that are lining this particular part of the cerebellum, the part of the brain that, that lets you move. And the processes of the Purkinje cells are the green branches, which you can recognize from my previous image of a single neuron. And they're interfacing with the glial cells, which are the red ones at the surface of the cerebellum and going down. So this is what the brain looks like in situ. And our goal is to understand how you get from those neuroblasts through self-organization, through all the different shapes and functions that the brain takes to let us do what we do. And so what we've done is moved into an in vitro environment where we can actually look at the cell and look at its processes and try to control what they do. And this is where Annika takes over. <laughs> Oh, yeah, see, we're, we're all running off with the mic. I have a little beeper on this here. Thank you. OK, I'm going to go right ahead, but um, I do want to mention that if anyone has any questions, please feel free to jump right in, as uh, was mentioned in the morning and has been mentioned again and again. This is aimed at being really interactive, and that's what I got same that. So please, the questions are welcome anytime. Um, so as Matt has said, cells are interacting with their environments and with the other cells all the time in the brain. And this is especially true in the initial phases. And what's um, doing all this sensing is the filopodia. And these are cells that, uh, these are structures that are found in a number of cells, um, not only in humans, but in other um, organisms as well. And within humans, they find a number of cell types, um, neurons, which we are focusing on, but also the migrating cells, um, fibroblasts that were mentioned earlier today. Um, what is common uh, between all these filopoda and all these cells is that there are thin membranous protrusions, rich in actin, um, and this, this makes them really dynamic. Uh, they, they're extending and um, retracting really quickly um, all the time during development, sensing out, like basically, again, um, antenna being sent out and retracted all the time. Um, and the high surface area to volume ratio uh, makes them really rich in receptors. Again, perfect for sensing. And that uh, makes them ideal for roles such as migration, wound healing, adhesions, anything that involves sensing of the environment. Uh, the specific population of filopoda that we are interested in are the neuronal filopoda. Um, and those are the little green structures you see extending out of this neuron. Um, this is a hippocampal neuron, um, and those are the ones that we're looking at um, from rats day one to two. Um, 
And all of these were put as about 200 to 300 nanometers wide. So they're really, really fine structures, and it's difficult to visualize them using um, simple ways. We use confocal microscopy, so we get slices and get nice 3D images to be able to see um, the entire structure. Um, the filipodia are present on axons as well as dendrites. Um, the ones on axons um, on, uh, involved in axonal pathfinding, um, most of you might have heard of um, growth cone, growth cone guidance, and those are the guys involved in that process. And that has been studied extensively. What's not been um, studied too much are these three other processes. Um, spinal genesis, which is formation of spines. So spines are the sites of learning and memory in the brain. Um, synaptogenesis, which are formation of synapses, the basic connections between neurons. And dendritic morphogenesis, which basically just is like axonal pathfinding, but for dendrites. It's in, um, setting up the dendritic tree. And in all of these processes, um, the filipodia that are involved are the ones on the dendrites. And those are the ones we want to focus on here. Um, since they're so important in um, processes that involve network formation, uh, there have been um, deformities and um, malfunctions have been implicated in a number of developmental disorders. Um, and that makes it really important to be able to study these specifically. And um, what people have used uh, conventionally are normal dish cultures, but they have their own limitations. You can't um, study specific subcellular structures. Um, you can't uh, focally stimulate things. So um, we decided to go into uh, microfluidics. And this is kind of why. So here is a neuron growing in a dish. Uh, as I said, this is rat hippocampal um, neurons. And as you can see, the cells growing out, um, sending out nice, beautiful processes. Those tiny ones there are the filipodia. Now, if you throw in a stimulant, a neurotransmitter, a cue, anything, trophic factors, those are being sensed by the entire cell. So you can't really um, separate out what's happening at the cell body versus what's happening at the processes, what's happening at the axon versus what's happening at the dendrites. So to be able to do that, you want a system where you could isolate one part of the cell from the rest. Um, that would also make a perfect control, because you would be able to um, compare what, um, how that part of the cell is reacting with how the rest, the rest of it is interacting. Um, so with that aim, we have to develop a culture system um, that is also um, close to the in vivo conditions and allows us to control. I mean, there, there are systems where you can separate out parts of the cell, but you can't really access certain regions. So that would defeat the purpose because you cannot stimulate them. So this entire IGERT fellowship for me um, has been um, a pursuit of such a culture system. And um, we've been reasonably successful in achieving that. We're putting it to um, work now. And I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to that culture system now. Um, so that's the device that we are working with. Um, it's a three-channel device. Um, the substrate down here, for those of you who were at my poster would be familiar with this by now. Um, this dark gray region is a simple glass substrate, a glass cover, silver glass button dish that, that's been used in cultures since a long, long time. Um, on top there um, is a PDMS device. That's polydimethylsiloxane. It's a polymer that's nice and transparent. It's nicely biocompatible. So it becomes a good system to be working with. Uh, we've been playing around with different dimensions for these channels, but um, essentially what they are are um, regions for us to put our neurons into. And then um, you see this little ladder structure here. Um, those are narrow channels. And they're called the interconnects. And they connect one big channel to another. And they form a path, basically a physical guidance cue for the cell to follow as it sends out processes into the neighboring channels. So the way this works towards our goal of achieving subcellular stimulation is um, that we, so this is again, three channel device. We add cells into one of the channels. That's um, C2 here. And um, those red arrows are pointing at the cell bodies. And as you can see, um, we don't have any cell bodies entering the neighboring channels. So that's kind of what the interconnects are achieving in a way. They're restricting the cells to one channel and also they're guiding the um, cellular processes to the neighboring channels. And that's what um, the black arrows are pointing at, the neurites that have grown into the neighboring channel. So at the end of it, we have one distinct cell body compartment and one neurite compartment. And that's the compartmentalization that we've been aiming at throughout this um, process. Um, to give you a better look at that, this is a high magnification image. Um, the eye is a membrane label that labels the entire cell. And again, what you're seeing here is on one side of these interconnects are the cell bodies that have been unable to cross over to the other side 
but they have uh, used the interconnects as a physical guidance queue to send out this process down to the other side. And again, this device being as cool as it is, enables us to selectively stimulate one region. So if I throw in a neurotransmitter or a trophic factor in um, this channel, these uh, philopodia will sense it, while the rest of the cell and the rest of the philopodia won't. So again, it becomes the perfect uh, control because you're not only comparing um, different cells within the dish, um, you're comparing the exact same cell, different regions of the exact same cell. And um, that's what is really unique about the system to be selectively, to be able to selectively stimulate one specific region of the cell while the rest remains unaware of what's happening. Um, so what's important for such a system to, uh, to work effectively is that if you're throwing a neurotransmitter into one channel, it should not be um, leaking into the neighboring channels. And this is just a way of demonstrating that that is really happening. Um, what you see are um, images of a slightly different device design. We have a narrower central channel in this case, and we throw in a fluorescent dye into this at t is equal to zero and then monitor the flow of the dye to see if it's leaking into the neighboring channels. Um, I'm, in the middle is just a fluorescent profile, just to show you what it's looking like as peak, but um, it's really, again, a cool way of analyzing these systems is a 2.5D intensity plot. Um, so down here on the X and Y axis, uh, simply X and Y axis of your um, field of view, and on the Z axis is the intensity of fluorescence. So wherever the fluorescent molecule is going, you see that as a rise in fluorescence. It's a simple rainbow scale. It's easy to interpret, easy to understand, and visualize. And as you can see, uh, once the dye is flown in, there's a peak in fluorescence corresponding to the central channel, but there is no uh, rise in fluorescence in sites. And um, this uh, is maintained over several hours as well. Uh, our stimuli that we are interested in are usually glutamate stimulus, so that's um, a very brief duration pulses. Uh, so again, we can very um, uh, assuredly say that there is no leakage happening at least during that time. So now that we have the system, um, there's a number of questions that we can address um, using this. Uh, our first aim was to look at um, how substrate-bound cues and diffusive chemical cues are affecting development. And while we're specifically un uh, interested in genetic philopodia, you could extend this and study any other developmental processes or even um, simple cellular signaling. Um, and that took us to aim two, which is chemical stimuli. Like I mentioned, glutamate is one um, uh, chemical that we've been very interested in right from the beginning. And then that sets, up, sets us up for studying cell-cell contact and how signaling could travel through one cell and affect um, development in there. So to focus on gradients um, first, um, so there's a really cool, part, uh, cool thing about microfluidic devices is at those dimensions, the fluid flow is all laminar. So it allows you to control um, the, whatever's being thrown in very uh, beautifully, temporarily, and spatially. And that's kind of what um, Larry did here, and this is a publication in 2010. Um, I won't go into the details, but what I want to show you in here is that just by introducing different um, cues in different channels uh, and playing around with the fluid flow a little, you can create different gradient profiles. So like in this um, beginning, you have two cues, the red and the green, and those are basically, again, just fluorescence visualizations to help you see the gradients. And you see different profiles as you go down the device. And also, again, you can play around with what cues you're introducing, whether they're in the center or the side channels, and get different kinds of profiles. Like in this case, you have one cue on one side and another on the other. So the cell in the central channel will face one cue on one side and another on the other. Um, so in addition to gradient generation, uh, we can look into chemical stimulations. Um, so before I go into that, I, I would like to set you up for this uh, bit of visualization. It's a little tricky, so uh, bear with me. Uh, this is, again, the three-channel device that we are looking at. What you'll be seeing is a field of view, uh, again, the 2.5D intensity plot. Those are the three channels there. Um, and what we've done here is we've thrown in a die, and we're trying to visualize it as it flows through. Um, to minimize the duration and see if we can get um, pulsatile stimuli. So as the dye travels through, we are visualizing that as a drop in fluorescence intensity. So there it was a fluorescent dye, so you saw a peak in fluorescence. Here this is a simple dye, an Evans blue dye, so it's like a blue. So you see that as a drop in fluorescence in bright field microscopy. So that's what we're going to be visualizing in the next slide. 
So um, this is visualizing a pulse in the device. So t is equal to zero, you have this red dot um, that kind of shows you where our dye is. And you see that there is pretty much uniform fluorescence within the entire field of view. At eight seconds, right at the top, you see a little dip in fluorescence, um, little dip in intensity. So that's showing you uh, the pulse entering. And then at t is equal to 18 seconds, you have the uh, pulse filling up the entire field. Uh, a little later, um, the pulse is exiting and within a few seconds, it's out of the field. And again, we've been w working with these, um, refining the technique to further come, um, reduce the duration of the pulse. We've been uh, looking at incorporation of valves in the system. It makes the device a little more complicated, but it allows you to control it that much more. Um, but with this, we've been uh, able to chemically stimulate cells. And um, again, we've used glutamate for that. Uh, this is basically showing that. Um, glutamate stimulation. What we have here is a simple three-channel device that we've been working with. Uh, we have neurons in all three channels in this case, uh, and we throw in glutamate only in the central channel. So this is a, basically it's showing two things. Firstly, visualization of signaling, as well as, uh, um, it's a visualization of signaling as well as a visualization of fluidic isolation. So if glutamate was to travel down these interconnects, and reach the cell next two channels, you would see signaling in those cells as well. But what we see is that cells in the central channel uh, signal beautifully, uh, which is shown on the right here, with fluctuations in calcium um, fluorescence. Uh, but the cells in the side channels show no signaling at all. So that kind of demonstrates for us is, um, firstly, those cells are nice and healthy within the device. They're capable of signaling, and secondly, um, Again, there is perfect fluidic isolation. The neurotransmitter itself does not travel into the side channels. Uh, and that takes us to the final uh, point in here, which is to establish cell-cell contact and to study that and how um, filopodial development might be influenced by cell signaling. So um, just to help you visualize the interconnects better, we've got this little bit of yellow there. So you can see that cells in this neuron in one channel is sending out a process and contacting a neuron in the adjacent channel. And now if I throw in glutamate in this channel, this cell will not um, sense glutamate itself, but with this cell starting signaling, it would conduct the uh, message down to this other guy, and that would influence filopodial development there. So not only can we study primary signaling with the cell sensing glutamate itself, but also secondary signaling with cells sensing other cells sensing glutamate. We can again extend this multiple times with multiple channels designed. So um, to summarize, um, we believe we have a beautiful culture system going here, a platform that is capable of um, addressing a number of questions that involve um, subcellular stimulation specifically. It's um, very um, reproducible. It's uh, easy to uh, make, easy to work with. Um, what's a microscopy beautifully, long-term, short-term signaling, what have you. Um, to end with, uh, the take-home message here would be that um, to study neuroscience, we've always been looking for a brain in a dish paradigm. And unless you get a brain literally in a dish or try to get neurons out of it, um, you don't really get a good system. But we believe that micro devices kind of bridge that gap. And without actually needing to put a brain in a dish, you get a brain in a dish. Um, and uh, I'd like to end with a big thanks to Dr. Gillette and the entire lab, Dr. Larry Millet who was instrumental in starting this work. Um, new members of the lab, Dr. Bashir, my co-advisor here, Laura for all the organization work, um, the animal care staff, the rats, the funding, and thank you guys for listening. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, do that eventually begin to diffuse? Or um, so the gradient that I've shown in here, right at the beginning, that is a substrate-bound gradient. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're throwing in the cues, whether it's laminin or whatever, and wait for it to bind to the grass. And then you remove it. And, um, and then you flow it out, and the um, gradient, the cue molecules remain stuck okay. there. That is permanent. Yes. Um, I mean, it would diffuse over years, but... Right. 
uh, for the time period that we are interested in quantum fields. Um, you can have diffusive cues, like things that are floating around. You can have gradients of that as well. Uh, but that would require a slightly more intricate device design. Mm -hmm. So you can exploit the laminar flow properties of this device. So if you have two inlets coming into the same channel, um, it, uh, if on the left side you're introducing the cue, it will stay there. Yeah, you can you can create dents to make it mix. You can keep them straight to prevent the mixing. Um, and um, there's the Fulch Lab, um, uh, and they have beautiful videos on their website where they've used colored streams just to help yeah. you visualize that. So you can uh, have uh, long-term effusive cue gradients as well, mm -hmm. um, and substrate bound cues to stay mm -hmm. for the integration. So, so how much is known at the post level? How much is known about changing the stiffness of the substrate? Is there a way in the device to change the stiffness um, of the substrate also? So again, you know, I think that's kind of why we need um, things like the IGER CMMB um, to bring together different fields like that. So people have been looking at stiffnesses and how um, neurons behave on different stiffness scales. People have looked at um, dendrite branching increasing or decreasing with things. Um, and people have looked at development devices, but that's not really coming together so much. Um, there are complications. Um, it's tough enough to get the device to bind to glass. You need these plasma treatments and things to get that going. Uh, it becomes that much more difficult when you have a gel substrate. So to vary stiffness, you need um, gels as your substrates. And to get the device to bind to that, it's, it's a little bit complicated. But yes, multidimensional um, PDMS devices have been made. Um, but you really want to look at polyacrylamide if you want to look at the stiffnesses that are very similar to the brain. So uh, we are hoping to get there, um, possibly by the end of this year. Um, maybe the experience in NUS would help, because yeah, they do so look at stiffnesses. Shing Tang probably can help you on that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, I was just looking at his posters right next to mine. So yes, yeah. definitely. Um, the device platform is very interesting, because you can also think about putting muscles in one channel. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes definitely, and definitely. Different regions of the brains, like the cortex has different layers, so you can put different layers and right next to each other. Um, there are ways that you can remove the device afterwards, so you have a very dish culture-like system, but um, to set up the initial organization, you can use the device. Um, and yes, with neuromuscular junctions as well. Yeah. Do you use any of the glial cells, or do you use conditioning media? Oh, th that's, that's, a, that's a really correct question. In fact, we've been looking at um, using this device as, um, uh, as a way to study neuronuclear interactions. Um, one way would be to have glia sitting at the inlet and have neurons in the channel. So as the media flows down, it brings in um, so it's, uh, continuous conditioning in a way, instead of just one way, uh, one time conditioned media. You could have glia sitting in adjacent channels, and then you could modulate flow. So it's coming in through them. You can have um, neurons grow out and contact glia in adjacent channels. Um, we have looked at that to some extent. We have had um, uh, the cultures going, but we haven't really followed that through with um, any specific studies. It's been more of a proof of concept that, yes, it can be done. And then um, so uh, since one of the things that we're looking at is filopodial development, one uh, question that we want to address is that um, how glial presence is affecting filopodial development. So that's definitely something we've been looking at. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.